Peace, Black Liberation. I'm Miki Mamubi, and you are listening to Black Matters with Lami Mumia on KUAW, Knowledge, Understanding, and Wisdom, KC's Global Community Radio Station. You're listening to us live on KUAW.org or on the TuneIn Radio app. You can also listen to us now live on Facebook Live and on YouTube. So if you are a frequenter of YouTube where you have a YouTube red, you can also subscribe to our channel. We recently started uploading not only our audio, but live in studio video. Get to know us and different hosts on the program via the YouTube radio app or YouTube, just a website you can go to if you're there. Today's date, June 19th, 2018, so they say. Today is the Earth Day of Felicia Rashad, popularly known as the Mother Huxtable on the Cosby Show. 1984 to 92, that was only a small slice of her uh, claim that she has gained as an entertainer, actress, uh, later winning a, uh, the first black woman to receive a Tony for her performance in the uh, play A Raisin in the Sun. Born on this day in 1948, hailing from Houston, Texas. On this day in 1864 was the infamous duel between the USS Kearsage and the CSS Confederate States of America, Alabama, off of Cherbourg, France. It was known um, that a brave black sailor by the name of Jonah Peace um, was involved in that battle and received a Congressional Medal of Honor. Might have been the first. African person to receive a Congressional Medal of Honor. I don't know that for sure, but I know it's one of the earliest. Um, but the quotes, uh, the account, he is quoted as being marked coolness. So the brother was cool during a naval battle in 1864. On this day in 1971, the mayor declared a state of emergency in Columbus, Georgia, due to a race insurrection. Also in this day, in 1969, state troopers were sent to Cairo, or Cairo, as is, as is known, I believe, Illinois, a town that, as NPR recently uh, reported, still is dealing with racial incidents and legacies of the white terrorism that has been around um, for hundreds of years there. But on this day in 1969, uh, it was also federal troops, state troops, rather, were sent in. On this day in 1865, uh, although the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1863, slavery continued in Texas until June 19th, 1865, when word reached Galveston, Texas, that all slaves in Texas were free. One third of the residents of Texas were enslaved at that time. Juneteenth was celebrated annually with um, picnics, as uh, some, and and including myself, object to the use of that word, and barbecues at public emancipation grounds, some of which were used to this day. The holiday became a legal state holiday in Texas in 1980. It is still not a federal holiday. FYI, for some of you rebellious Negroes who maybe decided to not go to work today to participate in Mm -hmm. the activities. We are going to talk a lot more about the history of this holiday and its modern day implications for African people in this part of the world. Stay tuned for our segment on that. Also on this day in Nine or 1795, I'm sorry, 1857, 
was the death of Alexander Twilight. Alexander Twilight, you might have never heard his name before, but he was reportedly the very first African in America to graduate from college. He was born on a farm in 1795 um, to a white or um, as we would call light-skinned mother, not really sure, Mary Twilight. It was kind of ambiguous back then. Sometimes that was done purposefully. Um, and his father definitely was a, um, is what we would call the product of a interracial um, marriage, Ichabod and Twilight. Ichabod, who was a black man with a um, white mother, served as a private in the American Revolution. So his son, Alexander, born in 1795, um, of course, used his undoubtedly his color, uh, but also worked very hard to become, even in, in Vermont. You would think up north it would have been easy, uh, but it was extremely difficult. Um, and he was able to reportedly was the first um, African in America to receive a college degree. On this day also was the um, founding of what is known as Freedman's Town. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on this one. Before we get to Juneteenth, we're going to talk a little bit about Freedman's Town. I am, um, was born in the part of the world known as Oklahoma, but raised for 25 years. I was a resident of a small town by the name of Houston, Texas. And, and while preparing for this, I was very shocked about the information that I learned about a town that I had lived in. In fact, I used to spend a good amount of my time in this neighborhood and did not even know um, the history of it. So Freedman's Town, if you've never heard of it before, is a nationally registered historical site. It was an original community located within Houston that was uh, a hotspot or a destination for formerly enslaved people. So after the slaves were the enslaved Africans were emancipated, they had to kind of carve their own. It was kind of, they were on their own. There were settlement government, uh, there was a Freedmen's Bureau, which was uh, a defunct organization after a few years, but formerly enslaved Africans had to really carve out their own. And Freedmen's Town, they of course named it after the obvious fact that they're now all freedmen, was located in Southwest uh, of, of, the, of the area known formerly as Allen's Landing, which later on became the city of Houston off of Buffalo Bayou, okay? So in, um, when they were emancipated in 1865, all of these formerly enslaved people started leaving the South Texas, going up north to Austin, Dallas. But the largest migration of formerly enslaved Africans was to Houston. They traveled along uh, the San Felipe Road up the Brazos River, and they got to Southwest Houston. Interestingly enough, the area known as Southwest Houston, which is a huge geographical area now, is also the home to many Africans who are either fleeing persecution in other countries or just straight black people. You know, that's just where a lot of black people used to live. Once the formerly enslaved Africans got to Freedman's Town, the area now known as Freedman's Town, they paved the roads in brick, they established communities, they built houses, and they only did this so that they wouldn't have to deal with the daily onslaught of racism and discrimination. Freeman's Town quickly developed as a cultural center. The Missionary Baptist Church in 1866 was formed, and it became uh, one of the many social and cultural institutions. The community and the larger Fourth Ward Black community that grew around it was prosperous well into the 20th century. Fourth Ward was very similar in a lot of ways. I'm not saying it was, but it was very similar to what we now know as Black Wall Street in Tulsa. There were many autonomous black communities in this country. Most of them were physically destroyed by terrorists who would come in and sabotage, or in many cases, um, as in the, the book, uh, uh, I can't, there's a, there's a book I'm, I'm gonna remember by in this program, that speaks about the sundown towns and how African Americans were persecuted in their communities. 36,000 in 1930, 36,000 African Americans lived in Freedman's Town. 
It had the hottest jazz clubs and restaurants. Uh, so it was basically uh, what we would now know as what, what we have here is 18th of Vine, a very prosperous black area. Now that's very interesting that we say that because uh, as a child growing up in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, by that time, uh, the area now known as Fourth Ward and Freeman's, Freeman's Town, formerly Freeman's Town, was a ghetto. Okay, completely destroyed in the sense that there was nothing but shotgun houses, um, massive drug use. Uh, it was a hotbed of crime. In fact, I believe H HP, HPD probably, the police department probably, like that's where they first started their their uh, their policies, or that's what they practiced and honed their policies of dealing with black people in the city. Um, in 1929, though, there was a there was a permanent racial segregation that took place in Houston, and that's how these areas really got carved out. Uh, it's interesting to note that I said late 80s, early 90s, those areas were were ghettos. In 2018, Fourth Ward is one of the most exclusive areas in the city of Houston. It has now been taken over by uh, mostly quote unquote young executives, uh, what I would describe as uh, young white colonists who have made it an extremely posh area. It is one of the only places in Houston where you can see remnants of, I don't, you know, maybe they're gone, but four years ago, you could see a shotgun house and across the street, a three quarter million dollar home, four story home, wow. with, you know, with quarter million dollar cars driving the right. It, it was incredible. Some of the streets when I last left Houston in 2014 still had bricks on them. And the reason I say this is so why we need to learn about the communities we live in. We need to learn everything. I used to walk down these streets going to restaurants on the weekend and, you know, just brunching and whatnot. And I didn't know I was living in one of the most, or walking down some of the most historical streets mm. um, by, by a time when that was the only place that black people could feel safe. Now, as a black person, you go in there and just like any time a black person goes into an all white area, like if you're walking by yourself in the plaza, you, you know, you keep your eyes wide open. You don't want to get caught off guard because white folk aren't really having it now. I think that when we talk about gentrification, we have to just talk about the subject of it being the newest form of colonialism slash white terrorism, moving black people around, as Mr. Neely Fuller says. Uh, but I was absolutely amazed by the information that on this day in 1865, Freemanstown, AKA Fourth Ward, uh, Houston was founded. We are going to take a short break. We're going to come back. Today is a very important day for African people in this part of the world. We're going to talk about Juneteenth, um, the history of it, and a few facts you might not have known about Juneteenth. Also, how we should look at it in the context of living um, in this country and the greater context globally, what Juneteenth should mean for African people. We will be right back. You are listening to Black Matters on KUAW, Knowledge, Understanding, and Wisdom. Yeah, well, uh, that's, a, that's another thing that doesn't go out. I've changed my wiring right because I need to have what's going out now is just coming out of the computer, so it doesn't go out on the internet because it doesn't go through this board at all. So I'm going So yeah, it's like quiet now that they are really thinking, okay, they need to hear those, you know, when we take a break, because I'm going to go ahead and push them up. Oh, YouTube is quiet, or on, on Facebook is quiet? Facebook and YouTube is quiet. Well, it's just one of those things, like I said, I was checking it out, and I said, okay, the way I got this wired, I didn't see what's happening here and stuff, so. All right. Peace. If you're tuning in, you're listening to Black Matters on KUAW, uh, Knowledge, Understanding, and Wisdom, KC's global community radio station. This is your servant, Lami Mumia. We are live here at Studio KUAW at the WEB Du Bois Learning Center. Uh, just quickly, we'll take a, a couple seconds, talk a little bit about uh, you know what's going on here. I don't have, uh, you know, we're not talking current events necessarily, but 
Uh, the WEB Du Bois Learning Center is a jewel of the community here in Kansas City. The BFTAA and the WE Du Bois, uh, du Bois Learning Center, uh, the Black Family Technology Awareness Association and WEB Du Bois Learning Center have come together to create this beautiful child, uh, which is now a couple years old, toddler in that sense, um, as uh, of KUAW. So if you've never been to the center, please come on down to the center. Um, there is going to be an open enrollment for students. What happens here at the WEB Du Bois Learning Center is um, students basically can get a competitive advantage by receiving tutoring. There's all types of tutoring here. Uh, I know math, reading, there's also robotics clubs. Um, there's also sports leagues that use the facility. Um, so if you want are interested in bringing your child or you want to volunteer, please come out for the open enrollment for the children on the 25th of August. So mark your calendars at 10, 15, 11, 15, and also on September 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th. Okay. Classes begin on September 8th. So um, you know, students are going to be tested in reading and mathematics, and then the parents get to have a brief orientation. Plan to spend about an hour. So the enrollment is $50 per student per semester. And honestly, as a person who didn't receive private tutoring and who went to school with, with children who did, um, I later became a tutor, a private tutor. The difference between children who receive tutoring, I don't have the facts and the statistics, but it was night and day night and day when it comes to the ability for students. And when I use that, that metaphor, I'm saying students can see clearly and have an advantage in the classroom. So even if your child is quote unquote ahead, if you want to use that phrase, uh, they can still benefit from tutoring. Our children can never be too smart to navigate the world and the educational system that we're in today. $50 is minimal. You can't even buy them a pair of clothes for less than $50. So parents, please mark your calendars for the open enrollment to bring your children. Or if you do not have children who are of school age, like myself, or you don't have children at all, that doesn't mean you can't come out here. You probably can help volunteer. I know I'm not a math whiz, but you can still volunteer and get out, get out here and help our community. Um, please mark your calendars. That's the WEB Du Bois Learning Center open enrollment for the fall semester. And uh, just as far as the classes, briefly, uh, you got reading, science, math, robotics, coding. OK, that's basic coding skills and applications, IT technician fundamentals and basic fundamentals, Cisco certification. Did you know that you can actually get and This is for adults. Is that correct? Yes. The Cisco certification is for, is for adults. Hey, that, that doesn't mean you can't go home and teach your children but Cisco certifications. Uh, if you don't know what Cisco certifications is, uh, the, sh the skinny of it is, is, is a very powerful certification uh, to work in the IT field. And it's been that for years. So it's not one of them like fads, I'll be here today and gone tomorrow. Cisco network sort of uh, technicians demand uh, respect and money in the IT field. And you can also, um, there's the DLC student IT support team um, and the adult basic computer classes. Uh, for seniors, but hey, I think all adults can come to that class. Is that correct? Or is that just for for, mm -hmm. for seniors? Just for seniors. Just for seniors. Okay, seniors. so you have the adult basic. Yeah. So if you're if you're listening, you have grand. You don't have any children in school, but you want to get hip to what's going on with the computers uh, and the new technology. I mean, heck, I'm getting to the point where I probably need to take a refresher computer course uh, because last time I took a course was 20 years ago, and no matter how good you think you are, you can improve. But this class is for seniors. Uh, Tuesdays in the morning. So those are just a few things that uh, always got to show some love to the center because it's, it's, it's literally a beehive of activity in this community uh, and, and to help out. Also, there's going to be a quick talent show or brief. There's going to be a talent show on the 23rd. Um, they were out here yesterday, the Mahat Foundation, Maya mm -hmm. Foundation. And um, I really enjoyed them. If you haven't listened to the program, I think it was the BFTAA Radio Hour. Yeah, BFTAA um, and more. And more show. Uh, you can catch the archive on our Facebook page or YouTube. But they're having a talent show with cash prizes, right? So it's not yeah. just for, for kicks and giggles. There's going to be money involved. <laughs> um, and you can catch that at uh, Building 1, which is off of 63rd Street, Location 1 building. Yeah, that's, 
Yeah, that's and, the audition. Okay, audition. Okay, right. So okay, right kids, on. the kids on the end, they can get into it now because an audition is coming out this yeah. weekend and another day. The actual talent show is going to be in July. Right on. So uh, June 23rd, this Saturday, July 7th, is the auditions. Yeah. And you, you got to audition to get in. You can't just show up with your hat and your, and your tap dancer shoes. You got to audition. So go to location one. That's on 1734 East 63rd, uh, East 63rd Street, Kansas City, Missouri. That's right by the uh, Metro Thriftway store. Yeah. And there's a Dollar Street exactly. next door. There's a building. I think. Um, across from Penners. Penners. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say across from Penners, Harold Penners. Um, you, you go to this building, suite 212, second floor, and, um, and you get from one to four. So if you want to bring your child out, four to 18 years is the limit. So. Uh, don't bring out two-year-olds, four to 18, and uh, you can definitely contact Sheila Walker, the phone number 816-863-8051, email myat, M-A-A-T, foundation, that's all one word, 2017 at gmail.com. So uh, you can also, you, you definitely want to learn about the Mahat Foundation uh, because it, it's a program for girls, which I believe really has some, some punch to it. I think they've really got a strong program, five to 18 years. I mean, you can learn about that if you go to that to the, to that location where the audition is going to be at, and they'll be more than happy to share that information with you. Definitely, definitely. So, uh, you know, today today's a, a very important day. I know when I grew up in, in South Texas, today was a very important day for black people. Uh, generally, it was summertime and there was always festivities. So my parents used to take us to a community center park, so we used to go and, you know, Juneteenth, we, we celebrated that. And that was a really big part of. But have we ever sat down and thought not only just what is Juneteenth, but how did it all occur? And the story, if you have not heard the, the details of, of what Juneteenth is, I think you might, like myself, be taken aback. And we're going to try to pull some lessons out of this. So we're going to, you know, kick off your shoes and relax your feet. But we're going to take a few seconds to talk about this. So Juneteenth was, it's a combination of the word June and 19th. June 19th, Juneteenth. On June 19, 1865, Major General Gordon Granger came to Galveston, Texas, to inform a reluctant community that President Abraham Lincoln, two years earlier, had freed the slaves and to press locals to comply with his directive. So let's let's talk a little bit about that there. So the Union General, the United States Major General, was given orders to come. So. Um, and we're going to talk about why it was a general, because you don't think that you send generals out to give messages. Isn't that interesting? Like, you don't just send generals just don't come into KC and say, hey, we got something to tell you from the army. Somebody has to send you. OK, he was sent by Abraham Lincoln to tell a reluctant community because they did not believe him. He gets to Galveston, Texas, and these black these poor enslaved brothers and sisters, they don't really believe this guy. They're like, man, you crazy. You trying to get us killed. Okay. And the locals, and, and when we say the word locals, we mean white people. Okay. We're not talking about the black people. No, we're talking about the local white people didn't want to, they didn't believe him either and almost ran him out of town. Okay. So the general was sent because, um, the general sent because they believe, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this, the question you might be thinking, so why did it take so long? Well, what a lot of people don't know is that in 1863, when this Emancipation Proclamation was proclaimed, was one, it only liberated the enslaved Africans in rebel or the territories of the Confederacy. Okay, so what does that mean? Basically, during the middle of a war, the U.S. government, the Union, we call the Union forces, said that, hey, all the people in rebel territories are free. Now, if you're being held by a hostile army and you are a few hundred miles away from the border, maybe let's say in South Alabama, how are you going to, who is going to free you? 
he didn't he didn't say everybody in the United States is, is emancipated and is free. He said only the people in a rebel hell there. So essentially the free Africans at that time, the Africans that were enslaved, that were later free, only came from border areas near the Mason-Dixon line or uh, the line between the states of the North and the South. Okay. Everybody else in the, remember the war continued until 1865. Everybody else in the Confederate held area stayed put. <laughs> and nobody said, you go nowhere. <laughs> You know that that crazy that crazy Lincoln might have freed you, um, but Josiah, you better get back on that ox, and keep keep it moving. Um, that bag better be a hundred pounds, hundred pounds of cotton in that bag by the end of the day. I'm gonna put one smooth in you, uh, pop a cap. So this is why the delay really happened. The reason why it took two and a half years after many decisive Union victories within the Confederate areas, including. I believe the war had already ended in Texas by by 1865. I may be incorrect. You you can um, you can correct me online if you know this, but I believe the war had ended in Texas by 1865, uh, June of 1865. The two and a half year delay. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of suspicion as to why it took so long. The historical site in Galveston says. The delay was because the messenger was murdered on his way to Texas with the news. Okay, <laughs> that's what the that's what the official plaque says. Mm -hmm. They killed the man who was supposed to bring the message. Okay, if that lets you know how they feel, I think white people have this phrase in Europe. They used to tar and feather. Isn't that what they they used to do? Tarring and feathering. Uh, they didn't just tar and feather the messenger. They just killed the messenger straight up. Some other people say, um, so the non-official story is that the news was just withheld. So, and, and I want to make this extremely clear. There were people who knew that the enslaved Africans should have been free. And for two and a half years. So I want you to just, all of you smart people who are listening, erudite, intelligent black people listening to this program, just imagine that you were in prison and a letter came in, not a week ago, or two weeks ago, a letter came in in January of 2016 saying you were supposed to be free. You had been in prison for 20 years. It is June of, of 2018 and the letter was given to the warden of that facility and all of the officers in the facility in January of 2016. So go back to what were you doing on January, in January 16, 2016? Go back, think about that. And for two and a half years, you spent in hell, in prison, with no rights as a person, as an individual, you could have been within that time, you could have been assaulted. You probably undoubtedly know your relatives who were assaulted, males and females. You maybe have had relatives who died, friends, family who died within that two and a half year period. And after two and a half years, uh, inspector comes to the facility and he says, what are these African people or what are these prisoners still doing here? because they were actually all released from their sentence two and a half years ago. I want all the African people to sit back and think about that. What kind of people, what kind of society, if you want to even use that word, I won't even dare use the word civilization, would perpetrate that type of behavior. And we have the nerve to say that we are celebrating Juneteenth. A lot of the celebrations, I believe now it's the second year in a row that the Nelson Atkins held a Juneteenth celebration a week or two ago. We dare say that we're going to go celebrate this holiday. Celebrate? Celebrate what? The fact that we were scammed, that we were harmed, we are going to celebrate with the great-great-grandsons and great-great-granddaughters of the people 
who enslaved your ancestors for two and a half years for just money, for just capital? If you don't understand what it means to be bamboozled, when you have the word bamboozled in the dictionary, you need to put Juneteenth next to it. You need to put Juneteenth was the greatest bamboozling of African people in this part of the world. And not only was it a fact of being bamboozled after we had been scammed, you would have thought that these Africans would have been angry. You would have thought these Africans, because they were free, would have risen up and have slaughtered the people who perpetrated that type of crime. The Africans just wanted peace. They just wanted to live in peace. So they left the plantations in Southeast Texas and they wandered up long and lonely country roads to find small towns where they could just be free. We have to think about that. So all of this celebrating that is being done on today's day, Juneteenth, all of this commotion that we want to make about Juneteenth, we should remember it as a solemn day. We should sit down and be quiet. Listen to the voices of our ancestors who suffered to just have peace. Now, an even more, an even greater scam that was perpetrated was the supposed abolition of slavery in 1865 in this part of the world. See, the bigger scam was the supposed um, the 13th Amendment, which we cool about and we're so, we're so cool with all this United States. You know, Ju July 4th is coming up and there's a lot of flags in our neighborhoods already. And we're so proud to be American. But we noticed that on, on July 4th, we're so proud to be American, when they passed that 13th Amendment, and said that we can still enslave you based on your, your status as a criminal if you're convicted of a crime. And all of a sudden, just magically, thousands and thousands of black people, mostly men, also women and children, are enslaved again in labor camps. The scam and the behavior by the people who classify themselves as white has not ended, brothers and sisters. We live in 2018 and we face just as many obstacles when it comes to uh, our quote unquote freedoms as we did then. We should not be mistaken. Juneteenth is a holiday that should remind us, remind us that right now, if the US government decided to put all black people in this country back in chains, who is the African American among us who could stop it? Who is the black person who is alive today that has the power to say the U.S. government cannot re-enslave all black people? Do you think we can go to courts and win that? Do you think if white people decided to, we got some kind of secret army sign somewhere, like the, the, the Hoover Crips or something like that are going to stop them? The South Side Boys and the Latin Kings, you think they're going to just jump up and all start doing drive on on, on, the, on the soldiers coming to enslave? See, we need to remember that the condition, the power differential that existed in 1865 still exists in 2018. That power differential has not changed. If white people wanted to tomorrow morning, they could put all of us back in chains. And there's no person, not Oprah, not Jay-Z, not even dear Beyonce, even President Obama could stop them. There is no African country that has the power to come to the aid. Can you think of one? Is there any African country who could stop anything the United States wants to do to black people within its borders? Juneteenth should be an extremely solemn reminder that we are dealing with the exact, and I mean it, like Nina Simone said, the exact same people we were dealing with in 1865. The question is, what are we going to do about it? We're going to take a short break, come back with some current events. You are listening to Black Matters on KUAW, Knowledge, Understanding, and Wisdom.
space program. You hear about Trump and that space program initiative? And, and, and we're saying that we will dominate and it's I not, it's not a defensive thing. It's that we want to dominate the space war. I, I used to think that morning. was a joke, but um, Mr. Walk, I think that if we laugh at that, then of course, see, there was this big thing about not militarizing space. Now it's like, you no, know, we're gonna go full oh, board. We're gonna colonial space baby. force. Space Force, yo. Yeah. Um, you remember the Star Wars program? Yeah. Come on now, less than thirty years ago, Reagan was saying the same. Thing. That that was a that was a thing that came up, and I'm thinking, okay, that we're supposed to be trying to make a treaty that you didn't on space, so you don't have nuclear weapons up in space, and we would have jumped on in there. How much time do I have? I'm gonna hold on that. We're gonna get you know, another minute. Is it what? Um, and now you have enough time. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up here. Uh, oh, I mean, you said your time. Yeah, you give me a little bit more time. Oh, yeah, we can do that. There's a clip I want to. It talks about the Star Wars program. Yeah, but. Okay. This is about three or three and a half, four minutes, so I think we might want to come in. Come in now. You about ready? Oh, we don't have to chop. Yeah, we can. Okay. Let me know. Okay, and we'll start this and we'll come out. Come on. Come on. I think we're not going to that we should develop what we have missing. And that is the way we feel science fiction. Some have been with the people that have talked about what science fiction is doing. Science fiction is something that other people should do. We need a genre. And then we're going to try and look at science fiction. It's very, very important. Possibilities. You need that. You, yeah. you, you'd be foolish to think that. Because he goes into on this, he talks about Star Wars in this lecture and how Star Wars is based on real technology, right. like holograms and stuff like that. That's real. And all of that is stuff that they're perfected. I mean, it's just like when you watch the yeah. Star Trek and everybody says, now, well, why the first phones, a uh, flip phone looks just like what they yeah. was a communicator <laughs> on Star Trek. And boom. So somebody's thinking of that. How will we design that? And go bingo. We all here thinking it's a joke. Yeah. You know? And yeah. they're like, no, this is, Let you know, they, write, they wrote books about flying planes. Right. And flying systems the moon. hundred years, years ago. Yeah. They knew they were doing it. Yeah. We're going to do it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
putting the AG Wells and then we're talking about they didn't have have enough technology know how to say anything other than we're gonna shoot it from a big cannon. Yeah, you know, they, 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 they had nothing about Roger doing that, but they say it's a can so, but we going. We go that way. So they had the seed is planted. And next thing you know, this know that. rocket was invented, which yeah. was like a big cannon. And we can do it. We there. Yeah. 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 yeah we we can take it down. Part of the yard. Peace. If you're tuning in, you're listening to Black Matters on KUAW, Knowledge, Understanding, and Wisdom, KC's global community radio station. You're listening to us live on KUAW.org, the TuneIn radio app to search for KUAW. You can get that from the Google Play Store, the App Store, or Facebook or YouTube, both of those. We are all over the interwebs. Uh, you can find us everywhere, so there is no reason why you cannot catch it. You can actually catch uh, HD video. We're streaming now in HD video on YouTube. KUAW Space Radio. KUAW Space Radio. KUAW Space Radio. Uh, that's this, this space, not our, not actual word space, radio. But speaking of space, <laughs> um, there has been a lot of talk among um, online about President Trump making comments regarding a space force. Now, we were just listening to the great grandsister, Dr. Amos Wilson. If you do not know who Dr. Wilson is, you can find that particular lecture on YouTube. It's entitled Amos Wilson, Rethinking Education, Star Wars, and Millennia Beyond. One of my favorite lectures, it's a 90 minute lecture and talks about the possibilities. Fast forward now to Trump. So let's bring it to what Trump said. Pentagon officially directed the, the I'm sorry, President Trump officially, this is from CBS News. I'm reading directly from their article here. And it quotes, President Trump officially directed the Pentagon to establish a sixth branch of the U.S. military in space on Monday. Speaking at a National Space Council meeting at the White House, Mr. Trump called for a space force to ensure American dominance on the high frontier. The president also signed his administration's third space policy directive calling for establishment of new protocols and procedures to manage and monitor the increasing numbers of satellites in low Earth orbit and the tens of thousands of pieces of space junk and debris that pose an increasing threat to costly spacecraft. The directive follows on the heels of two other major space policy initiatives being implemented by the National Space Council, one calling for returning humans to the moon before eventual missions to Mars and another aimed at streamlining the federal space bureaucracy to reduce red tape and streamline licensing oversight of commercial space activity. In remarks that range over a variety of unrelated topics, Mr. Trump began by saying current U.S. employment levels were the best in recorded history and blaming current immigration problems on the Democrats, saying we have the worst immigration laws in the entire world. Turning his attention to space, the president praised the National Space Council and its chairman, Vice President Mike Pence, for its work refocusing national space policy, saying, for too many years, our dreams of exploration and discovery were really squandered by politics and bureaucracy. We will knock that out. My administration is reclaiming America's heritage as the world's greatest space-faring nation. He went on, the essence of the American character is to explore new horizons and to tame new frontiers. Emphasis but our destiny beyond the earth is not only a matter of national identity, but a matter of national security. In court. I hope that when black people hear the words of President 45, Donald J. Trump, they take it seriously. You see, a lot of people are joking. They're making jokes about what Trump is saying. But you have to understand that white people have a long history of taming new and wild lands. In fact, I was told that when they got to the moon, if they ever got there, 
that when they got to the moon, they put down an American flag. As African people, and this is something Amos Wilson brings out, we should know what it means when they put down a flag on a new land, or on any land in fact. They are claiming that. There is supposedly a US flag still on the moon today, okay? Uh, we want to make fun of the sixth branch of the army or the sixth branch of the armed forces, but we don't understand the serious implications of space dominance. Essentially, Dr. Wilson brings out that whenever the white man decides he's ready to go into space, he has completed conquests of the earth. That makes sense, right? You gotta, you gotta have the earth on lock before you go out in space. And he is planning to do the same thing that he did here on the earth in any other new land he goes to. Now, I remember in the article they're talking about there's very costly space equipment going up and there's a lot of satellites in low earth orbit. Now we have cooperation from Elon Musk and these um, companies, SpaceX, mm -hmm. which are basically privately funded arms of the government who are privately funded, but the government wants coordination with them to get equipment up into space. Multiple governments use them to um, essentially transport their contractor in a few or subcontractor for the U.S. government. So this private partner, uh, private public partnership, which is, has, has emerged in the form of companies like SpaceX, because there are also other space companies out there mm -hmm. uh, who are not only doing uh, commercial government work, but also planning to do tourist work in space. So what does that mean to you when white people are deciding they got to go out in space? Do you think they're going to, if they run into anybody out in space, if they run into any other life forms, do you think they're going to treat them any better than they treat you? You see, when Europeans left Europe, they might as well have been getting on a spacecraft. But they knew that whatever land they got to was not going to be equal to them. The word that that Donald Trump uses and I think it's very key. He said, and I'm quoting here, the essence of the American character is to explore new horizons and to tame new frontiers. But our destiny beyond the earth is not only a matter of national identity, but a matter of national security. Please tell me you don't remember that there was an official U.S. policy that was later on called Manifest Destiny. Do you understand the death and destruction that came out of that policy, or all we can do is be keyboard warriors and laugh at Donald Trump. We're so busy hating this man, we're missing some major plays that are right in front of our face. We're so busy barbecuing and eating fried chicken and, and grilled chicken on Juneteenth that we are missing. These white people have decided they're going to take it out into space. This is not the first time that space dominance has come up in the queue of a presidential regime. Ronald Reagan spoke about the Star Wars program in the late 80s. A lot of people wanted to laugh at Ronald Reagan then when they later found out that British intelligence had satellites that were capable of reading license plates on moving vehicles from 22,000 miles in outer space, that British intelligence had the ability to listen to conversations inside of buildings 30 years ago, people started sobering up. Can you imagine what the capabilities the U.S. has to use their space forces now? Do you understand that if you launched a weapon that it will likely be intercepted? If you launched some type of ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile, it will likely be intercepted by a satellite that is in space now? Oh, you just thought all the satellites that went up were to help us get TV signals and to help our cell phone service? You think they were taking 50,000 tons of cargo on the Challenger and the Columbia space missions up into space into the ISS? You think that's all scientific research? You think all that's just doing is figuring out how bugs can survive in space? The white man has decided that they are going to take their <laughs> colonialism, if we want to even call it that, to another frontier. They are going to take it in space. How many space stations are in Africa? 
how many spaceships are in Africa right now ready to launch? Which African nation has a space program? Now, I don't care whether you're a PhD or a one, two, three in your education level. The answer to that question is probably universally known. There is no African nation. There is no African nation that has the technology to one, defend itself. We spoke about that in our last segment about Juneteenth and the ability for African uh, African nations and their, their ability to use power. And, and two, uh, there is no African nation who has research capabilities in space right now. Now, don't get it twisted. Dr. Amos Wilson in that lecture says, hey, they'll send some black people up in space, but we're always going to be on the coattails. Okay, we're always the sidekick. What is this? They have a library off of um, 31st and Prospect. Is that 30, 31st and Prospect? Yeah. Um, the Bluford? Yeah. Buford Library? That was an astronaut. Okay, FYI, if you weren't familiar, that's named for a black astronaut. So we can ride on the coattails and we can go up with the white people in the same pathetic position that we were in um, 150 years ago and be their sidekicks, but they will not allow African nations. As African people, we need to start thinking about a world where we have space dominance. You know, I gave a lot of, of negative reviews and a lot of negative thoughts to the movie uh, Black Panther. But we must respect the fact, even if you don't agree with the message, that African people need to visualize themselves in a world in a dominant position. We cannot continue to visualize ourselves as abject, broke sidekicks in this world. It is extremely important that we pay attention to these events and not only use our education and, and, and uh, to go buy Bentleys and Rolls Royces and ensure our family has money for ourselves and three generations to go live in Italy whenever we go on vacation, whenever we want to, but we must use the education to move African peoples forward. Use the education. The coding classes we were talking about here earlier, offered at the WEB Du Bois Learning Center, the Cisco certification, the science, the mathematics. Hey, I asked a very insightful, a very wise older brother. I asked him what he thought we could do to end global white terrorism. Specifically, is that the question was, would we ever have to go to war physically to liberate African peoples from their pitiful condition and, 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 and that we're in today. And this wise man's answer, he said, we probably would. But if we didn't go to war physically, we need to start giving our children chemistry sets. And I kind of chuckled and I thought to myself, what does he mean? He means we have to be scientific. African people, it's time for us to be scientific and pay attention to the signs of the times. We hope you enjoyed today's program. We also hope that you found the information in um, uh, useful and constructive uh, to replacing white supremacy with justice immediately. Uh, shout out to the cows and the uh, Invisible Man study group that's going on right now. You can catch the archives on um, the context of white supremacy. You can get there on the app store. You get the podcast. Very much enjoying that book. Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. We will be back next week with some more constructive information. We want to ask that we show the highest levels of black self-respect at all time, that we focus all of our energy possible in replacing the system of white supremacy with a system of justice 